Hey everyone, happy Friday. This is painting number 15 of the Summer Paintings Project. And this has been a great week. This has been a challenging week. Painting symmetrical objects is kind of difficult. It's not the easiest thing to do, but it's been a good challenge. And next week is a new theme and I don't know what I'm gonna do yet. So you'll find out on Monday, me too. If you've been enjoying the content of these videos and you would like to support this project, you can do so by just sharing these videos with anyone who you might know who is interested in art or painting or watching somebody like me paint. I would super appreciate it. These paintings are also for sale over on my website for $250 a piece. That's the only way that this project is supported. So if you're able to buy a painting that is awesome. If not, these videos will always be 100% free and available for anyone. So let's get to it, let's paint. Okay, so this is the last painting of the week. This is Friday. And today I decided that I would take a little bit of a break from the super high key, really saturated paintings that I have been doing for the past few days. And when I was thinking about what to paint today, Katie grabbed this off of my sister-in-law and brother-in-law's counter, this mason jar with some green onions in it. And I was like, sweet, actually, this will be a really good painting for today. This will be fun to paint. And I like that there is this pop of green color in it, but it's not like neon green. It's a really earthy green. And for the most part, it's pretty muted. So I decided that I would just set it on a wooden tabletop and put a piece of white foam core behind it and that would split the composition up vertically and that would allow the transparency of this mason jar to really play a large role in the painting. So I got it set up and I threw some bright light on the jar and onions and wanted it to have this really strong, sharp cast shadow on the background. I thought that would be interesting to see how that played out in the overall setup. So yesterday we talked a little bit about materials. I talked about paint and artist paint, student grade paint, and my views on paint. And so I thought today that I would follow that up with a little bit more info on materials and materials that I use. Not that you need to listen to my advice on materials that much, but let's talk about brushes a little bit. So for probably about the last eight years or so, I've been using brushes from this company out in the UK called Rosemary and Company Brushes. And they are a little company. They started out really little. I think they've gotten a little bit larger since I started using them, definitely. But they're this little family-run company that still makes the brushes by hand for the most part. They're shaping and placing the hairs of the brush by hand, and they do an excellent job. They really find the natural curve of the hairs that they're using, whether they're synthetic or natural hairs, and they get them all to come to this beautiful sharp point. And the brush style that I definitely use most frequently is a long flat. And the shape of these lung flats is basically one that comes to a nice sharp point. And I use it a lot as a chiseling kind of device. I love that sharp straight line edge that you get with the tip of the brush hairs. And I really do use it kind of like a chisel. I will paint shapes usually a little bit bigger than they need to be. And then the, the next shape over, as I'm painting that, I'll chisel back into the first shape to basically get the drawing drawn in accurately. So I'm kind of pushing wet paint into wet paint on every single edge for the most part. And that's an approach to painting that I'm really fond of. I really adore the look of a wet into wet painting. And so it makes sense why I bring up someone like John Singer Sargent a lot because he was amazing at painting wet into wet. If he didn't get an area of a painting to a level of finish that he thought was acceptable, he would actually grab his painting knife and just scrape that area back down so that he had to go in and paint it with a fresh layer the next session. 
And that's just a look that I really love in a painting. I love wet paint being pushed into wet paint. When it gets built up and really crusty, almost like a Lucian Freud, I like that look on a painting, but for my own paintings, for some reason I don't like that look. I can do it for areas of a painting, but in general, I really like a painting to have this sort of unified, focused look where all of the paint looks fresh, all of the areas look like they were painted in a single sitting. And that's actually how I like to paint anyways. I do really love painting areas in a single sitting. If I know I have to draw a painting out over multiple sessions, I will do a sort of general simple underpainting for the entire thing, but then I really will zone in on particular passages that I know I can knock out within one sitting. I love the look of a wet into wet painting, and that's kind of the surface that I just always gravitate towards. I, I like that fresh look. I like the rawness of it. I like the attitude of it. It doesn't feel too fussed over, and it feels really confident. There's something about that rawness. If I think about painting and its relationship to music, wet into wet painting feels like it has more of that emotional rawness of something like a punk song or a folk song or a piece of music that wears its heart on its sleeve more, is really honest and in your face. Granted, I love really highly polished paintings, paintings that have months of work invested in them. I think that's fantastic. But if I'm thinking about my own painting process and my own temperament as a painter, even if I do create a painting that takes a month or more to create, I do try to preserve as much of that wet into wet, almost a la prima surface quality as I possibly can in the final painting. So continuing on with brushes, there's a few brush lines that I really love from Rosemary and Company. And one of them is the series 279. They're these long flat brushes. I think they're called the Master Choice line, and they basically have like a mongoose hair or something similar to a mongoose hair. But man, I love the snappiness of this kind of brush. With that snappiness, there's also a lot of give. So it's a kind of brush that holds its shape yet feels soft to the touch. It's a fantastic brush. I love using it. A few other lines that I really like using from them. One of them is called the Ivory line. It's basically a synthetic hog hair brush. It's a lot silkier and a little bit more springy than a hog hair brush. It gives just slightly more than a hog hair brush. So I really love it for that. It feels like something that you can easily push a lot of paint around with. It works a little bit more like a shovel that digs into the surface when you use it and less like a sable brush that's really soft and will just lay paint flat on the surface. So that's another line I really like, the ivory line. I typically use their long flats or their extra long flats for those. And an uh, in-between line that I've been using that I love, and I think I used it quite a bit in this painting, is their line called Evergreen. And their Evergreen line is similar to the Ivory line, but it's a little bit softer than the Ivory line of brushes. It's a synthetic. It feels like somewhere between a hog hair and a sable. So those brushes are awesome. If I needed to do an entire painting with a single brush, it's kind of like a really nice all-purpose brush. It can do just about everything. It can kind of push paint around. You can abuse the brush a little bit and really push a, a large volume of paint. But it's also soft enough that you can do a bit of the more delicate work with the brush. Granted, it won't do what like a sable or a mongoose hair brush will do to where you can paint into a wet cushion of paint and it doesn't really disturb that cushion. It really preserves it and allows you to do surface work on top of a wet cushion of paint. So in those cases, like if I'm doing something really sensitive, like a portrait or painting something that's really nuanced and I need to do lots of little 
nuanced work on top of a big cushion of a blocked in area of paint. I definitely will always grab either a mongoose or a sable brush. And, and unfortunately, there's not really any good synthetic versions of those. You can't really get the amount of spring and the amount of holding the shape that you can get with like a mongoose hair. Usually the problem that you run into is that the brushes are almost too springy and they either disrupt or pull up the previous paint passages that you have already done underneath. And the way I paint and the kind of surface that I like to achieve is just not really possible with a synthetic brush. It kind of is, but there's just certain types of passages that I wouldn't be able to do if I didn't have a natural haired brush. So those are the kind of brushes that I typically use. This sort of ivory line, really nice synthetic hog hair iteration of a brush. This evergreen line, which is a little bit in between. And then my softer brushes, I'm usually using this, I think it's called Master Choice series that they make this mongoose hair brush. I also will use the pure red sable line that Rosemary makes. I use some of their one stroke brushes. And I actually use their watercolor riggers a lot. I mean, they're made for watercolor painting, but they work amazingly for oil painting. One other line that I actually just picked up earlier this year that I've been experimenting with and I actually like a lot is Rosemary's line that's called Eclipse. And I've been trying the extra long combers. They're really similar to an extra long flat or a long flat. And to be honest, they remind me a ton of the Royal Langnickel brushes that I used to use when I was a student. They used to make these mongoose hair brushes that were awesome. They didn't have a ton of hairs in the brush itself, but they held a really nice shape. But the only downside to those Royal Langnickel brushes was that they lost hairs like crazy. So as you'd be painting, you'd be like, oh, this feels great. I love how this is pushing the paint around. But then you'd be like, oh, I lost like three hairs in that brush stroke. And so then you would end up having to grab a palette knife and pull those little hairs out and hope that it wouldn't mess up what you did. So I kind of stopped using those. But these Eclipse extra long combers are really feeling similar to those, and I like it. They could potentially be a replacement for the mongoose hair brushes for me. Maybe. We'll see. I'm liking them. They feel pretty good for me. So that's a really generic crash course on the brushes I use. And again, I do typically just use flats for the most part. I'm really interested in trying out some more filberts, I'm trying to use filberts a little bit more frequently. I, I really just need to bite the bullet and buy some of these. There's this sort of cat's tongue shape that I've been really curious about seeing how I would paint with this cat's tongue shape brush. So anyways, enough talking about the materials and the nerdy stuff with the materials. I can talk about materials for days. I'm definitely a materials nerd with paintings. Not too much of a snob. I will try to make a painting with anything that's in front of me. But if I have nicer materials available to me, I definitely want to use the nicer materials because it makes the job easier to do. It makes painting more of a joy. So I definitely err on that side. If I'm going to invest in materials, I typically will buy nicer materials, ones that will last me a long time, and ones that I'm really happy with how they perform and how I can use them as an artist. So there is my sales pitch for Rosemary and Company brushes. They don't pay me, I just like them. And <laughs> I've never gotten anything for free from Rosemary, but they're a great company and they are a family owned company. They do what they do really well. And you should buy some brushes from them if you're looking for some new brushes. Check them out, Rosemary and Company in the UK. So let's talk about where I'm at with this painting. Something I decided to do with the composition of this painting that I haven't done with previous paintings very much is include these two sort of side borders in the painting. And I didn't intend to do this in the beginning, but then I realized as I was painting and I had done the setup that this piece of foam core that I set behind the jar of green onions 
was only so wide and that the wall next to the foam core was showing up in the composition of the painting. And so I was really happy about that because this is one of my favorite kinds of compositions. If you look at any of my past work or my passage series of paintings that I've been working on for the last few years, this is a compositional device that I love to use. And it's having these two borders on the sides of the painting. I don't know what it is about it, but I am really attracted to paintings that have these sort of two stripes down the side. And it might have something to do with it making a painting feel a little bit like a doorway, or that the painting has an internal border already in the composition of the painting. Whatever it is, I really love this composition. And I also was happy that one side was in shadow and the other side was in light. So on the left side, you get this nice, rich, dark shadow that's cast on the wood paneling of the wall on the left. And then on the right side, you get that same wood paneling in the light. And I didn't go in to try to paint the texture of the wood paneling. I don't want to overburden the surface with a lot of texture. I want it to feel fresh and want it to feel like a single thought of painting from the start to the finish. It feels like something that you can digest with your eyes easily and there's not too many competing thoughts or too many competing ideas happening in the painting. It feels consolidated and feels like it has a single drive and a single focus. So we are done with the theme for this week of painting these still life objects that are more or less symmetrical and have a color focus to them. And this was a good week. It was really challenging. Some of these really bright, colorful still lifes that I was working on midweek really challenged my paint mixing patience, you could say. I had to really be careful to not undershoot the saturation on a lot of them. And so that's why today I kind of gave myself a little bit of a pass and went back to something that's a little bit more earth tone, a little less saturated. And I was very happy to do that. So today's painting felt great. I also really loved painting this jar, this transparent jar, and it's funny, when you paint a transparent object like this, you end up having to paint the background first, and to paint the object itself, it actually doesn't take that long. There's just a few color notes that you pull on top of the background that just make this glass object sort of appear, and I love that. I love how quickly the object just seems to come out of the painted surface with not a ton of brushwork. It's a beautiful thing, and I really love the feeling of that. So I hope you all have a fantastic weekend, and next week will be a new theme. I honestly haven't picked the theme yet, so we'll find out on Monday. Stay safe, and I will see you all on Monday. Take it easy. Bye.